so we get you. I'm nervous. <laughs> I talk in front of kids all the time. And <laughs> anyway, then I thought, you know what? These are my friends and I don't want to do this. I just got all my stuff. Okay. Um, as Tracy Lee said, I'm doing um, Luke 15, 1 through 7, and it is the parable of the lost sheep. And it is so good. And this is quite ready. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to read this to you to start with from the message uh, Bible. Uh, I'm using my phone because I don't, my Bible's ESV, but anyway. Um, all right. By this time, a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered, triggered this story. And this is Jesus talking. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? When found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no, in no need of rescue. I loved that version um, of that of the, this parable. So I'll refer back to it, and I'm going to lay this here because I was sure if I need those or not. Okay, I want to start by asking some asking a question: Who is Jesus? Because this story tells us that tax collectors and sinners. People of questionable reputation were just hanging around. So who's Jesus? Why? Right? Like that's something I, you know, I don't know. It made me think of that. So the Jesus, we would all give adjectives of Jesus, right? He's kind. He's caring. He's loving. Um, he is, um, he's kingdom focused. Isn't that, wouldn't that be another reason, you know, that, that sinners would, would be hanging around Jesus? Um, these people knew, you know, that he cared. Um, I just, he's welcoming to all and he truly cared about them. Um, I, um, want to remind us in John 10, and I have this marked in my Bible, John 10 verses 11 and 14, Jesus refers to himself and he calls himself the good shepherd. And so I, I think that's very important, uh, when we read this parable because, we know that's who Jesus is, um, then this makes total sense. Um, I want to read those two verses. Um, 11, verse 11 of John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Um, in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Um, being the fact that he is the good shepherd, he's going to be attracted to hanging out with the, those of questionable reputation, right? And so that answers the question of who is Jesus. Um, Jesus came to seek the lost. I think Jimmy referred to this. His sermon Sunday was like totally in line with this. So I was like taking lots of notes, but he came to seek lost people. He came to, to the sick, not to the well, you know. So those people that were gathering around him, um, I mean, I guess they knew they needed something, right? Um, I... Uh, I told the ladies at my table, this story came to my mind today as I was, again, reading over all this. And I said, okay, Lord, if you tell me to tell the story, I will. And if you don't, then, because, anyway, it's about being lost, okay? Um, I, we were on vacation in 2019. We were going to Gulf, Gulf Shores. I point to leader because they were with us in Alabama. And I, I don't know if anybody, has anybody ever been to Gulf Shores? It is in Alabama, isn't it? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> we used to go to Florida, and then that one time we went to Gulf Shores. Anyway, kind of random. But anyway, we stayed in the house. It was a really big house on the beach. And I mean, I am I am a detailed person, but every if you're standing on the beach looking at the, the houses, they all look the same. They're just they're they're different colors, but they're just they're all look the same. Anyway. And then if you look out in the ocean, all you see is the, the oil rig. I mean, like, just that's all you see. And so, anyway, one morning I go for a walk, as I always do. And I thank Jesus I did have my phone. 
and I set a timer and I thought, well, obviously if I walk 30 minutes in this direction, then I'll just stop at the timer and turn around and go 30 minutes back this way and I'll be back at my the house. I don't remember what morning it was of our stay, but it was not like the last morning. But anyway, well, apparently, you know, based on the terrain or the bumpiness of the sand or whatever, you walk slower and faster, right? So it's not consistent. That is not a good plan. Anyway, I got back to my timer going off after the coming back part, and I was standing there, and I thought, I, I had no idea where I was. I mean, I knew it wasn't our house, but, I mean, I had, honestly, I was terrified. Even though I had my phone, I was like, it was just that feeling of, uh, you know, anyway. And I, thank goodness, had my phone, and called John, I'm like, I'm lost. He's like, what? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, how do you get lost? But it all looks the same. And uh, y'all should put a flag or something. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he was, he found me and said, just turn around. You passed us. And anyway, Papa, leader's husband, comes out to get me. And I was so glad to see him. You don't understand. I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I think, though, if we can say Papa, you know, might represent Jesus, you know, um, and the fact that being lost, that feeling for me was absolutely terrifying. And a lost person may not, you know, be able to say like, yeah, I'm lost, you know, what about you? But they're missing something. And if we would actually, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but if we can see them through the eyes of Jesus as lost, you know, and actually like being, going to hell, being separated, that should terrify us, you know, for them. Um and then I thought about this. Why are sinners attracted to Jesus? Well, for the reasons we already said, he's he's kind, he's he cares. Um, they knew that he, you know, he he had something they needed, I think. Um, he had what their souls needed, you know. Um, sometimes we don't know what we need, but he always does. Um, I almost skipped something. Matthew 9, verse 36 says. This is about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That is how Jesus sees lost people. He sees them as harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd, and which is why we have the parable of the lost sheep. Um, and I want us to remember that all of us were once lost sheep. Um, I think it depends on how long you've been a Christian. Some of us may say, well, it was just a couple years ago or 30 years ago or... I don't know all of you. Maybe you're lost. I don't know. But we have to remember those of us who are not that we were all once lost sheep. And so that should make us praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> Jimmy mentioned this this Sunday. He said, all people need Jesus, even those who seem to do good. Because I think some of us, you know, I don't know if you guys heard him say that or if he only said it in my service at 8 o'clock. <laughs> but he said, he was talking about Molly. Uh, she was like the good child who didn't seem to do much, you know, wrong, but she still needed Jesus just like, you know, everybody else. And so I thought about myself because I, I was sort of that kid that didn't necessarily do horrible things, but I needed Jesus. You know, I was sinner. I was born into it and I needed to be rescued. So um, we need to see lost people, you know, as far from God and, and be thank thankful that if you're not lost, that you are found. Um, and another question, how do you view the lost? Because the Pharisees and the religious leaders were grumbling. Um, <laughs> of course, the MS, the message says they growled. He takes in sinners and eats with them. So, so how do you view the lost? You know, it's easy to be kind of judgmental about their lifestyle or even the way someone looks, you know, their appearance isn't kind of what we expect. Um, and we may not even know their hearts, but <clears throat> this, this question convicts me about how I view lost people. I guess it convicts me more so because I should care enough to have compassion like Jesus does. That's what's convicting to me. Um, I want you to picture faces of people, of any lost sheep you know. You, you probably have somebody's name in your head a lost sheep that you would say, yeah, that person's lost. Um, or people you just meet as you're going about your day. Uh, you don't know their hearts, but um, just 
just having compassion for the lost um, is, is what we are striving for. Um, and another question, I keep asking questions because I want you to think, are lost people attracted to you? Do they gravitate to you because you are a person that seems to want to befriend all people? Uh, are you kind of snobbery toward people that, I'm not saying you even know they're lost, but just just how do we come across to people? You know, because really people who are going to become Christians do that most of the time. It can be through evangelism in a foreign country, uh, kind of like you just go into their home. Um, but it, it, it a lot of times, especially in my opinion, in America, it's the relationships. You know, they, they, they get to know a Christian and they're like, wow, you really do love me. You really do care about me. And I see how you live. Um, it can be total like God, the Holy Spirit can do anything in a moment, but um, if lost people are attracted to you and care and know they're cared about, they're more than likely going to ask you about Jesus. Um, and this just hit me yesterday, the last um, verse about the rejoicing. I don't know why, I mean, I've studied it for the last two weeks. They had a party and uh, I just think Jesus he could have just said, you know, why wouldn't you leave your 99 sheep and go find the one lost sheep? But he says, I'm going to read this again in the message. When found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Um, we should rejoice, you know, with, with people when they turn to Jesus, and we should, um, of course, praise the Lord if we're found. Um, so, last question. What do, what do you, what should we do with the parable? What, what should you do with it? I don't know. I want to talk about a lost sheep that I love very much. And his name is Scott. <laughs> and he's my twin brother, and he's lost. And she said to make it personal, and it was just really today that I thought, I need to talk about Scott. I love my brother, but he's a lost sheep. And so all of you know a lost sheep. You may not know many. Um, sometimes I have to confess, I pray for my brother, but sometimes I get, um, I don't know. It's like, I'm like, well, I don't see anything happening. God. And he lives in Nashville. He's not even local, but so I'll just, I don't know. Maybe it's not that I don't care. I just maybe stop praying. So I'm just saying this because I think it's probably common. And so I think the Lord reminded me this since Tracy Lee asked me about it. Don't give up. Pray. Keep praying. Um, whether you see fruit or not, he is listening. Okay. And if we really believe that he's the Lord of the harvest, then we can trust him. I can trust him with Scott to say, you do what you need to, to reach him. Um, I, 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 my, the questions I would say are, who do you need to reach out to? I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know who's in your circles. Who do you need to reach out to? Who do you need to invite to, to, to dinner, to lunch? Uh, what, that, that looks different for everybody. But if we really take this parable to heart, we, we should examine ourselves and say, oh, well, who do I need to do that with, Lord? Um, and have you given up hope? That, that's my last thing. Um, it's so easy. I, I know... Sandra, I hope you don't mind. We've been praying for her husband in our group who's a lost sheep. And um, don't give up hope. I mean, it feels so hard when you don't see fruit. But um, I want to leave you with Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I didn't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Because Jesus did leave the 99 to go after the All right, well, thank you. Well, our next um, speakers are actually in Canada. And I want to tell you that they are a great answer to prayer because I was approached by two people in this church um, by a ministry that the women's ministry and that women's Bible study should go after um, the one. And um, my heart was greatly grieved and 
I was on my face before the Lord in tears because I did not think that Jesus would say no to the ministry of Samaritan's house in Jefferson City. But yet I didn't know how God was going to answer that because I knew that it was something that I personally couldn't take on with my hands full and my family. And, but yet I knew that Jesus didn't want, you no, know, I knew he wanted a yes. I just didn't know how he would fulfill that yes. But I had a weekend to pray it through. And through that weekend of praying it through, the Holy Spirit brought all the faithful laborers. And part of the laborers were these two women, Caroline and Kathy. And um, they were so faithful to the Lord. And God had put a burden on the hearts for Samaritan's house. And he put on their heart that ministry and to minister to these women. And he had put to sow into these women and to cast seeds. And part of that ministry, and not to only go out and speak to these women, is the two part of that, and that we would provide a meal. And in April, the second part of that is that someone from the women's Bible study is to provide a meal. And so I'm presenting that to all of you, um, that that is still a need. So tonight, um, Caroline and Kathy, would you please come up and share what the Lord has put on? Thank you so much. And Katie, Katie. <laughs> I, I, I promise not to get that wrong, but my heart, I, I thought I was going to burst into tears when I'm talking to you. It's okay. okay. <laughs> this is Carolyn. <laughs> um, so we are talking about the parable of the sower, and I'm going to start by reading that again. So that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. But all the people stood on the shore. Well, all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? Shall I um, straight after that reading, says in verse 11, he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. And that confused me because the disciples had come to him asking the question because they did, obviously didn't understand what he was saying. So what do you mean? You know, why do you talk in parables? So... In verses 18 to 23, Jesus explains the secret of the kingdom parable to them. So I thought about this, and whenever you hear something from the Bible you do not understand, who do you ask for what it means? I ask Jesus, because if you ask, it shows you are listening and that you want to know more. Jesus says, keep on asking and it will be given to you. In other words, the seeds are sowed on the fertile soil of your heart and God always gets you the answer. It may be through reading more of the Bible, through cross-referencing the scriptures or from a teaching from someone, but he gives you the answer. So because Jesus' disciples asked him, what does it mean? He gave them the answer and I'm going to read that for you in Matthew 13, 18 to 23. I'm going to have to look at my Bible up. My glasses aren't that great. 
the brand new. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Okay. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last very long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And that really, I felt that today because think something was going on in my life where problems were just absolutely overpowering me. And I had to phone people to ask them to pray with me. And thank goodness they did. Because... You have to show God that those problems are not greater than him. He's greater than they are. And the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word, and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. I really like this because at age 12, I was at school and we used to have assemblies every morning in school. I didn't go to church, I wasn't brought up in church. Uh, my parents were not Christians. And we had a daily assembly with a Bible reading and a lesson. And school was the place where I received my kingdom seeds. Every day I got kingdom seeds. So from age seven to 11, the headmistress, the teacher taking the assembly in junior school would ask a student to come up and read from the Bible. And they often asked me because I was a good reader with a loud, clear voice. And I loved reading out loud from the Bible. I didn't know then, but I realise now that I was sowing seeds back then, even though I didn't know. So at age 12 in assembly, the headmistress read out this whole parable of the sower, all of them, and I was fascinated by it. It's my favourite one. And I went away asking myself, mm, what kind of seed am I? I want to be the one that produces 30, 60 or 100 but I don't know which kind of seed I am. And then eventually over the years, he revealed to me the Lord, I had in fact been every single one of those seeds. And two years ago, I was teaching um, this parable, this very parable to the boys in the Dandridge Detention Center. And I told them I'd been asking myself the wrong question. I should have been asking what kind of soil am I? Am I the rich and fertile soil, the good soil? And we can become rich and fertile by asking the Lord for his Holy Spirit as we read and study God's word for the understanding of it to seek deep into our hearts. Now I ask myself, what sort of sower am I? Katie and Tracy Lee asked me if I'd share in the kingdom work of teaching or sowing seeds to the families at Samaritan House. And it came at just the perfect time for me. The women there are those who through life's challenges and they've maybe had partners who they may, needed to get away from, they find themselves homeless. They're allowed to stay there for 90 days. They must get jobs to help support themselves and I help to find alternative accommodations. And I have a real heart for such women and families because I've been in that position myself at one time and I felt there was no hope or way out. And oftentimes the chains that bind families into homelessness are generational curses or mental health challenges like I have. So every other month we give them seeds of kingdom hope Seeds of self-empowering prayers, they can say. Mm -hmm. Seeds of looking and asking Jesus into their hearts and lives. And seeds that will take away their chains forever 
their very lives to be reborn like we were. So my gifting is an evangelizing, but don't ask me today. <laughs> if you do, you're very, very upset when it comes out. <laughs> so I have a baker and I pay it. And I say, will you do me this? Will you do me that? And so tonight, there's loads of chocolate-covered strawberries over there, and I'm not taking any home. <laughs> so you've all got to take some home with you tonight. But that's that's my, that's not my gift in the cooking. But we do need people to come alongside us at Samaritan House who do have a gift for um, these homeless women. They've got a heart for them, and they want to provide food for them on the nights when we are there giving talks. So maybe your Bible study would like to volunteer tonight, and maybe when you all get together again, you could possibly discuss this, and the group leaders could tell Tracy Lee about it. Or someone would be willing to start a volunteer list of what people are willing to cook, because these women are so grateful for everything they get, and every other month is not a lot. So please, if you feel moved to help these families, we desperately need food every day. Now I'm gonna share how God used the seeds of various people in my life to draw me to a knowledge of his saving grace. So it was in the spring semester of my sophomore year in college, right, when God called me to himself. There was an open air evangelist who came to campus, and his name, I don't know why, I was uh, was named Cliff Connectly. On the night of his week long share at the, or at, on the last night of his week long sharing at, at Duke University, at where I went, God took the veil off my eyes and really opened my eyes for, for me to be able to see clearly my sin and the desperate need I had um, for Him to save me. And that was, the, that was the last seed that he used in order to bring me to himself. But prior to this, I had a guy friend who was relentless and asked me what I thought about God at every lunch or dinner we happened to share together on campus that year. Prior to this, during my freshman and sophomore years, the captain of the women's gymnastics team, on which I was a member, and the coach of the gymnastics team were also strong believers. And they dropped seeds into my life. Before this, I had an English teacher in high school who had us write a paper contrasting the Big Bang Theory, Evolution, and Creation. He also dropped seeds into my life. Prior to this, while growing up, I spent a lot of free time in a gym training as a gymnast, hence the reason I was on the image of the team at Duke while in college. And the secretary of that gym, as well as her daughter, who was also on my team, also dropped seeds into my life. Before all this, I had no understanding of Jesus' work on the cross for me, nor any understanding of scripture. Growing up in a dry, dead Episcopal church in, North, in Southeast New Hampshire, there was no learning of God's love nor scripture reading at all. While he blessed me with wonderful, loving parents, they were not believers at the time either. They since came to know the Lord, praise God. Um, but <clears throat> however, once he saved me, he engulfed me in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, large group meetings on campus, um, and a strong, wonderful church off campus. And then the summer after I was saved, I was able to attend Young Life Camp at Windy Gap, North Carolina, which helped me solidify my understanding of my commitment to the Christian faith and what I now believe. <clears throat> I hope that short testimony, you can see how God used the seeds in my life to draw me to himself. And I'm forever grateful to those people who were obedient to his call to go out and make disciples. And so now that God has given me a desire to be good soil and uh, help spread seeds myself, Caroline and I have agreed to go share with the women at Samaritan's house. So both of us have been in um, a, a, a women's shelter before. So anyway, that was one of the reasons that God, I think, tapped me on the shoulder there. Um, this is a ministry, as she was explaining, for women who are temporary homeless. So they're allowed to stay at the safe house for 90 days while they get back on their feet. Basically explained and find proper jobs and housing to be able to support themselves. So True Life Church and David Nolan have been part of this ministry for a few years. And he asked me one Sunday if I'd be willing to um, be part um, to go out and help there once every other month. Then I asked Caroline if she wanted to join me and decidedly she said yes. So Tracy Lee then was asked by David 
um, if the Women's Bible Study would be willing to provide a, a meal three times a year during the times that Carolyn and I share the Word of God, testimony, and prayer with these um, homeless women. So currently we go every other month on Tuesdays from 5 to 6.30. The next one being April 2nd, as she also mentioned. So we're asking for any of you who might be willing to help us spread more seeds to these women um, in challenging situations by providing a meal on those evenings um, that we go. Since Becky Sonnemeyer's group um, has agreed to do the three of the six evenings that women, the Women's Bible Study has been asked to do the other three evenings during, this, during the year. So if you or some people in your small group are, um, have the gift of cooking, sharing, a meal with someone in need, please let us know. Um, as I already mentioned, Women's Bible Study is needed to help us provide a meal three times this upcoming year, in April, in August, and December. Those are the months that um, we would need help providing a meal. So, it's about 25, yeah, so between 25 and 30 women. So, um, and the last thing you forgot, they, they looked it. Yes. <laughs> it all went. <laughs> Thank so, you. Anyway. Thank you. Yes. Do you stay in that dinner? Yes. Yeah, we get there in time to eat with them or you want to eat prior to time too. Um, and then we share briefly and then pray with them if they want and just sit and chat and get to know them a little bit. So you don't have to stay for that part if you don't want. If you just want to drop the meal off and go, like we're there for that part of it. And David Nolan's there every every time too. And there's another church that does it opposite ones that we're there. Okay. It's so funny because he came up to me and said, Will you get our names right? <laughs> before that all before that all happens. Um, the last woman to speak, uh, we had um, uh at the meeting started that originally had Ayana made that women's conference I can get and then from the change is over by the way it because of us and then um pastor james like robert and then the lord put on my heart to have um this week from the hymn so we have all the ones we need so we to throw to uh tonight the last person is is Replacing someone who in this thing, and this tells you how the Holy Spirit is working. And when I, the Lord had put her on my heart to initially speak, and she was sick for a couple of uh, weeks. So I said, Lord, if she's supposed to speak, then please have her come back to Plainsburg. And she, she was sick, shot, sick. Yes. And it was so interesting. On the first side, this person that was speaking had the parable of the plot of the sun. And so I called yesterday. This tells you what obedience to the Lord can do. And I said, do you have a parable that you identify that is on your heart that the Lord has spoken personally to you? She said, yes, I do. And I said, could you speak for five to ten minutes on this? She said, Yes, I do. And I said, What is the term? She said, Prophet Son. Mm -hmm. So would you please join me in welcoming her to Um, first, I want to say, whoever made that cinnamon cake, you did the Lord's work. <laughs> is it, oh, that was you? The cinnamon one? Was, yes, yes. Yeah. It was wonderful. <laughs> so, everybody knows the prodigal son, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from them, and I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible. Um, says, then he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them inappropriately said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So he divided the estate between them. 
A few days later, the younger son gathered together everything that he had and traveled to a distant country. And uh, there he wasted fortune and reckless and uh, immoral living. But when he finally came to his senses, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough food while I'm dying here of hunger? Um, but the father said to the servants, quickly bring out the best robe for the guest of honor and put it on him and give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. But the elder brother became angry and deeply resentful and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. So I'll just share a little bit about me first. Like I was raised in church. Most of it, like whoever was in my groups know this. But my stepdad was a non-denominal pastor, non-denominational pastor. And my daddy was a Baptist pastor. And my mom was also a minister. So I was like always in church. I had to like teach Sunday school, which I didn't like because I didn't like kids. <laughs> they made me like lead praise and worship, but I didn't like because I didn't like standing in front of people. So this was weird for me. I don't like this. Um, um, and then we had obviously like Sunday school, morning worship, Wednesday Bible study. And that wasn't enough for my mom. So she had prayer meeting. And then that wasn't enough for her. So after school, we had like homework. And then we had homework from Janet, that's my mom's name. Um, so she said, with family Bible study, every week she would give us scriptures and we got it seven days to learn it by the next Bible study. So it'd be like, you got to learn the first, the first book of the Psalms and we need to know it by the next week. So it just wasn't like fun for me. I'll just say that. So just like the prodigal son, when I got 18, I moved out and I didn't really go to church after that. Um, I just lived my life reckless, not like really thinking about any consequences. Um, but every time I got in trouble, I would call my mom. And I would like, you know, mom, pray, please pray for me. And and she would do it. She would pray for me. And then she would like what I would call preach me through it. Um, and at the time, I, in my head, I was thinking like, you know, you taught us all these scriptures and you know, I just want you to go to your secret closet that you was telling us about and you go pray for me and you figure it out. And then God gonna take care of me. And I heavily relied on her, her relationship with God and her like faith in God and her connection in God. Um, and so I even had the audacity at sometimes for whenever I did pray, because I only prayed if it was like a big, big thing, like if I was really, really, really in trouble, then I would pray. And I would even like try to bargain with God, like, well, Lord, if you do this, I promise I won't do this. Ooh, if, you, if you get me out of this, I promise I won't. And I did that like a lot. Um, but I never, in thinking back on it, I don't even think I even had faith because I didn't even believe in my prayer. I believed that my prayer was going to happen because my mom prayed for me because she had faith and she had the connection with God because she was religious. And um, so just like um, the prodigal son, I, he, like he spent his inheritance and he thought that it was going to last forever. I thought that like I can continue just to go to my mom and she was going to get me out of trouble. She was going to pray for me. And I was going to be good. And I didn't really need to do uh, anything else. Um, and so when his inheritance ran out, that's when he felt like, wow, this is the problem. And so for me, it was when my mom passed away that it was like, I didn't know what to do. So obviously I was devastated. I was hurt. I had like just, I, didn't, I really just couldn't even think. And I remember the phone call I got, it was March 27, 2020. And my family FaceTimed me because at the time they were, the paramedics were there and they were trying to like revive her and stuff. And so it was video call. And I remember that day I fell to my knees and I was begging and pleading with God, like, please don't take my mom. And at that point, I don't think I even been on my knees praying. And I don't even know, I don't know how it had been that I like actually like got on my knees and prayed. But I remember that day I like fell to my knees and I was just pr like praying to God, like, please don't take my mom. I like, I, what would I do without her? I need her. I can't live without her. Um, but she, she passed and then I was like angry with God. And it was like, well, why would you take her? And I was, I remember even like praying to God and I was, I would name people like, why didn't you take this person? They're a bad mom. Why would you take my mom? Like, why would you take, why didn't you take, like I was naming names, like my aunts and whoever I could think of, like just angry and bitter. And so after she passed away, we, um, I had to go back to California and we like were packing up her stuff. And like, I remember just going over, like seeing like her notebooks and her Bibles and stuff. And um, I grabbed her notebook and I just kind of looked at it and just, it made me feel good to see her hand, her handwriting, it just made me feel good. And so I got like a box and I packed up 
like some of her notebooks and some of her Bibles. And it was not because I had this intention on studying it. It was just because those were like valuable things to her and that was like important to her. And I just wanted a, a piece of her. And so when I came back to Tennessee, the package finally came and I opened the box and like I started looking through the notebook and I was actually, I started reading it like for real, for real. And so I was reading the notebook, I was reading the notes and I remember like seeing prayers that she had written out for me and my siblings, um, things that had come to pass that she had written out and even in her Bible, the notes that she had wrote. And so like, I just started reading it and I didn't have a reason for why, I just started reading it. And after I read it, I kind of felt like, okay. And then, so the more I started reading it, like I started to feel like a little bit better, a little bit better. Um, and then just like uh, the prodigal son, like something just clicked. I came to my senses and I realized the more that I read and prayed, the better I felt. And because it felt good and I just didn't, it was like, it was kind of getting rid of that pain for me. Um, I still was obviously like in mourning and stuff, but it was like I was able to get through it better than how I was handling it. Um, and so uh, because of that, then I really started like reading, it, really like getting into the Bible and everything. And just out of nowhere, like it's like five years later, a year later, out of nowhere, God revealed to me the answer that I asked, March 27th, 2020. And that was why my mom. And so what he said to me was, I was so focused on my mother-daughter relationship and he wanted to be my father. He wanted me to focus on my father and daughter relationship. I trusted my mom and I wanted um, her to just do everything for me. And I needed to be trusting in him and relying on him to do everything for me. I cast my cares on my mom and he wanted me to cast my cares on him. He was El Shaddai, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh. He was everything that I needed when I needed it. And just like the father in the parable, God gave me gifts. And I realized that he covered me like a robe with his grace and his mercy and forgiveness. And then it was like he gave me new sandals because I realized my walk with Christ was different. But the gift that I received that I did not expect was spiritual growth and understanding. And in the story of the parable, like the father met the the son, like he saw him from afar. And I just was thinking that like, God will meet you where you are, but he loves you so much that he won't leave you there. Um, and so at that point, once I started to like really start getting into my word and I kind of just like started to like have more spiritual understanding and more spiritual maturity, um, then I realized the purpose in all my pain. And so as parents, I just want to say to parents or grand, anybody that has influence on kids, Proverbs uh, 22 and 6 says to train your child up in the way that he or she should go and he will not depart from it. Um, and so just like the Bible, to me, the Bible to me is like them old maps that was in the glove boxes when we was kids. And like nobody knew how to read them, but <laughs> your parents knew how, your grandpa knew how, but you would never have just given that map to somebody and said like, you know, tell me how to get from point A to point B. You had to teach them. And so with our kids, we have to do the same thing. We have to teach them or they'll be lost. So like teaching your kids to pray, teaching your kids to really, really study the Bible. Because if you don't know the Bible for yourself, and if you don't study the Bible for yourself, anyone can tell you anything and you'll believe it. So you need to do the work yourself and teach your kids to cross-reference scriptures, teach your kids to pray and ask God to reveal things to them and to let the Holy Spirit come on them and to touch their hearts and not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Um, and because I really do think that if my mom hadn't done that all those years, although at the time it didn't feel good, and it, I don't even think it, I mean, it stuck because as I started to read the Bible, I remember like little scriptures like, oh, I do it only, I remember that. But if she hadn't done that, I don't think that I would even be where I am right now as far as like my spiritual maturity. And, and believe me, I have a whole, I have a long, long way to go. Like I'm not where I need to be, but I wouldn't be where I am if she hadn't like instilled that in me. Um, and then, I also just think for um, actual believers. Um, if you're like praying for someone to be saved, I would just urge you to keep praying um, because I'll be 43 in a couple of weeks. So it took me like 38, 39, 39 years to get to this point. It took that long and I was raised in church. So if you're praying for somebody that ain't ever been 
like had a relationship with God, don't believe in God, don't just not quite there. It took me 38, 39 years and I knew better. So if you're praying for someone that is in that space where you're like, you know what, they really need to be saved, then I say I would just say that keep praying, um, keep believing. And also too, just know that you are not God, so you are not the savior. And just like my mom was like my savior, I had no reason to look to God because she was doing all my saving. So sometimes you have to let people go and let them get through it to go through it. And so sometimes you may have to back off while you're praying for people, love them at a distance and just keep praying for them. Um, and then there is the, um, for also other believers too, like how I was always praying to God when I needed something. If you pray to God whenever you're in trouble or because you need something, I think you might want to just kind of reevaluate your Christian walk and just think, think about like praying to God for his presence and not praying for presence and your relationship with God will be different. But then there's also the judgmental, jealous, angry, stank attitude, hypocritical, holier than thou brother. That was also me too. So once my, my mom passed away and like now I have this spiritual understanding and I'm like feeling real good about myself. I have a brother who he just didn't respond that way. My sister and I, we did. And he just, I don't know, we were raised the same way and I just didn't understand it. And so I was angry because in my mind, I felt like he should have got it because I got it. He should have understood because I understood. We was raised the same way. He had no excuse in my mind. This is how I was thinking. Um, and so like the brother in the in the prodigal son, you know, he wanted everyone to know how that he had did lived this good life and he walked this path. I don't want recognition, but I did kind of like throw in his face from time to time that like, you don't have no excuse. Like, you, and I even was jealous at one point because I said to him like, well, at least you were there. You got to be there. I didn't get to be there. Almost as if like my pain and my sorrow and my trials were greater than his. Um, and so, before, as believers, before we start like judging other people and trying to tell people what to do, you never know the trials and tribulations that other people go through. So it ain't our place to be judging and saying like, well, mine was worse than yours. That wasn't my place. And I did that with him a lot. Um, and then um, after a while, because I just kept on with it, um, the thing about spiritual maturity is you start to get convicted and that just doesn't feel good. So then I had to change how I like talk to him because God was like making me feel bad about it. Well, he wouldn't make me feel bad about it, but I did because it was I, like it was convicting me. I really did, you know. Um, and so I just started whenever he would talk to me or call, I would just like whatever he says something negative, I would just counter it with something positive. Um, and so after a while, I just start just thinking to myself, like, you know what? My job as a believer is not to judge him, it's not to condemn him. And not to be angry because he didn't get it the way that I got it. My job was to be his sister, love him, meet him where he was, and pray for him, and just continue to pray for him. And that's it. Well, um, that's um, the end of um, our speakers tonight. And before we do communion, there. Um, there is a song that was, was on the heart of Caroline and Katie's heart, and we're going to play it, and why we're playing it, um, it's by Zach Williams, and you know it, Chain Breakers, and I think it speaks to the heart of every all these parables, don't you think, that isn't that what God is? He's a chain breaker. He breaks the chains of going after um, the, the, that one lost um, the one that's lost, um, he goes after, um, he, when he sows that seed and he makes it fall on that, that rich land. So, um, that rich soil, can you pass, take one and pass the rest down. And when he is, 